my talk, Compiling to Containers. I'm Adam Gordon Bell. This talk, I'm going to talk about how container images are made. I'm going to show a tool that I think is really cool for doing so, which is BuildKit. We're going to learn a bit about compilers. Um, and we're going to do some code demos where we build a bunch of containers uh, in some interesting ways. I'll also talk about the future of containerization. And I think this is a lot to cover, but the big takeaway I hope to give everybody is about how containers are created and also to show some tricks, some things that maybe you didn't know were possible. So about me, uh, as I said, Adam Gordon Bell, I'm a software engineer. I'm a developer advocate at Earthly, which is uh, we make open source build tools. I, I like compilers and I like developer tools. I think that's going to become apparent as we go uh, through this talk. I also have a podcast about software engineering if you want to check it out. So a little background before we get into it. You probably know what a container is, uh, and if not, I'm sure there's some talks at DockerCon that can help catch you up. Uh, but do you know the difference between a container and an image? So the way I like to think about it is by analogy. Um, an executable is a program you can run on your computer. And when you launch it, it becomes a process, and you can launch however many processes you want from that executable. Similarly, an image is something that's not running. And when you run that image, it becomes a container. And you can run many containers from a, a single image. So an, an executable is to an image as a process is to a container. You could also imagine like a virtual machine as well. Uh, a virtual machine image is like a container image and a running VM is like a container, except that an image is immutable. Um, like an executable, it doesn't change when you run it. This analogy is going to be important as we talk about how Docker build works. So where does an executable come from? How is an executable program created? But here's an example, a C program from Dennis Ritchie and Brian Kernahan's uh, C book. So the programs on the top, it's a simple hello world. And then we're going to use Clang to compile that. Clang is a front end for the C language. It's part of LLVM. And when we compile it, we get an executable called main. We run it and we get hello world. So when we build that program with the compiler, we get something like this. Uh, here, I'm compiling the program to x86 assembly. So my executable ends up with this assembly code. Uh, the assembly code maps one-to-one -one onto machine code, which is binary, uh, which is much harder to read. But the machine code is what my CPU knows how to execute. My machine architecture, in this case, x86, it understands these commands. So here's a Docker equivalent. We have a Docker file on top. And we build it using Docker build. This is how we produce an image. So the process is similar to how we built our Hello World. The Docker file is passed to BuildKit along with the build context, which is a dot in this case. And generally, each statement is turned into a layer as part of the build step. And those layers are packaged into an image. One thing that's different from a traditional build, like we saw in the previous steps, is we're not just taking in the source code. With Docker builds, you're actually taking in a file system context. So in this case, we're getting our present working directory. And that's how we can do things like this copy, copying a readme in. So comparing our compiling C to our Docker building, we can see how they look quite similar. And the container image compiler that does the heavy lifting behind Docker build is BuildKit, if you're on a fairly recent version of Docker. So what's BuildKit? BuildKit is on GitHub, it's an open source project. It, it drives not just the Docker build, but a number of interesting cloud native projects, such as OpenFast is one, which is uh, serverless functions that run on Kubernetes. There's Rancher Rio, which is an application development engine for the cloud. And, and there's probably like tens of other cloud native projects that are using BuildKit. And that's what I want to dive in today, BuildKit and how it works. But to give you an intuition for how it works, um, and then to build something with it, first, we need to learn a little bit more about compilers. So earlier, I had this diagram about how the compiler works with Hello World, and it's a little bit of a lie. Maybe it's a simplification. Let me explain. On the left here is the PDP-11. The PDP-11 was the first machine a C compiler was written for, and it was written by Dennis Ritchie. And the, the simple, it worked exactly like the simple uh, diagram I showed earlier. The C code will be taken in by the compiler and it will be converted to PDP assembly instructions. But this direct mapping posed a problem. Whenever you have a new machine, it means you need a new compiler. 
And then what language do you write that compiler in? The, the first C compiler for this PDP-11, it was written in PDP assembly. You don't have to repeat that for every machine architecture. What happens when the VAX 11 comes out or the new Apple M1? You don't want to have to redo all that work. This problem was very quickly solved by compiler authors by coming up with this structure that you see here. They said a compiler can be split into three steps. You have a front end that takes in your source code, your various files and tokenizes and parses them. You have a middle that's an optimizer. It does performance optimizations to make your code run faster. Um, at some point they called this the middle end, which is kind of a weird word that I'm glad didn't catch on. Uh, and you have your back end, which actually generates the assembly that your machine architecture can understand. So now you don't have to make a compiler for each machine architecture. You just have to make a new back end. And this all relates to Docker images, trust me. The trick is to get all the backends speaking the same language. And for that, you need an intermediate representation. You need a language that isn't C, but isn't assembly either. It's somewhere in the middle. And once you have that language, all the backends need to do is translate from that into the machine architecture that they want to run on. So in the first example, we used uh, Clang to compile our C program. Clang is a front end for the LLVM compiler, which is a compiler that follows this three-tier structure. It was originally created as a research project um, at university, but it's now heavily supported by Apple. Once you have this kind of three-tier structure and this intermediate representation, you can now have multiple front ends as well. This is what modern LLVM looks like. It started with the Clang front end, but now it has many. There's been like a Cambrian explosion of ahead of time compiled programming languages that happened in the past 10 years as a result of it being easy to add something new on the front here. And the reason for this is that this IR acts as a common interface between layers. It's like a common protocol. And on the back end, uh, the number of backends has increased too. We now have a WebAssembly backend, um, which means you could run like C or Julia in your web browser. And there's even a GPU backend that, you know, in theory, you could run things on pixel shaders. So if you can build a front end and emit IR, you have a new programming language that can run on all the things on the backside. And if you can make a new backend, boom, all of a sudden, all these languages support your new machine. So this is super cool, right? And the secret is just this intermediate representation. The front ends need to emit it, the back ends need to consume it. So bringing this back to containers, Bilkit works the same way. It has something called LLB IR, which is low level builder internal representation because containers need to be able to run on a lot of machine architectures as well. And once you have an IR for varying backends, same deal, you can start varying the front ends right now uh, as well. So right now there's only a couple of these uh, and the most popular are just the standard Docker syntax that you know and love, but it doesn't have to be that way. So LLVM IR looks like this on the left. It looks like a verbose and explicit programming language. LLB is, is quite different. Where LLVM is the basics of a simple programming language, LLB IR is a language for creating self-contained cloud native packages. So now that we understand this structure, let's jump into some specific examples. Let's see what we can do with BuildKit. We'll start off with building uh, a simple image um, and then we'll get more and more complex until we're building our own unique syntax. So this is the simple example I showed at the beginning. So we start just from base Alpine latest. We copy in the readme for this project, uh, which is over here somewhere. Um, and then we're just gonna issue, we're gonna create this file with an echo. So we would just build this like this, demo one. Um, and then if we run this, we can validate uh, we want to run demo one and we want to start the shell. So it should be base Alpine, but it should have our readme, which we can see there. And then as it was being built, it should have created this, this build.txt file, which we can see there. All right, nothing mind shattering there. But now let's move on. So let's install build kit. So what we're going to do is when we do a Docker build, the Docker daemon calls build kit, uh, depending on your settings. What we're going to do is, is start it up and call it directly. Um, and so to do that, we're going to use this program we just installed called build CTL. 
And then we also need to start up the build kit daemon. Um, so the way that we're going to do that is just to start it up as a Docker container. So I'm going to start up a privileged Docker container, Moby build kit. I'm going to call it build kit. All right. So if I do that, you can see it here. Um, I also need to tell. I also need to tell build kit, uh, build CTL where to find it. So I need to set up an environmental variable for doing that. So I just do that like this. So uh, build kit host, and this tells it where it is. So whenever we run build CTL, it's going to read this. No, that's the host that it should send build kit uh, things to. Okay, so once we have that in place, we could just build the same file, uh, but a little bit differently. So now we're going to be calling build CTL. We're going to give it the build command. You can see how it has some more options. So you can specify a front end. So you can choose from any build kit front end that exists there. You also can specify where the context is. This was like our dot in our in our previous one. Um, you can also specify where the doc file is so they could vary. Um, and, and here we can specify an output, right? So we're specifying to create an image. We could also create a tar file. Uh, this is sort of the back end that's being used. Um, and our name. So we're going to call this demo2 and we're going to push it. So this will allow us to build directly with BuildKit. The reason we're we're pushing it is kind of interesting because now um, we're building this inside of that container that we started up. It's it's got a, its own file system um, that's isolated from ours. So we're actually going to push it to a registry, and then that means that we have to pull it down to run it. So if we do kind of the same thing, we're going to start up our demo too, um, but we're going to pull it first. Oh, you know what? We forgot to do one thing. So before we do that, let's actually change what we're saying here so that we can actually see that we did something differently. We're not just starting the same image. Um, so just copy the build statement in here. There's our build statement. And now we can see build kit built. And then if I do docker run, I see, actually, let's just pull it first. We can pull down agbell demo2, right? And then we do docker run, it agbell demo2. Um, then we start a shell. So now, Obviously, we will have the same readme, right? But question is whether this updated. Look at that. OK, it worked. Great success. So that's just how you can use BuildKit directly to build things. You, you know, the only reason you might want to do that is you want to get towards some of the steps that we're going to that we're going to get to next. So we talked about how the way that this architecture works is there is like a front front end, right? And the front end sends some sort of IR, some sort of intermediate representation. Um, and it sends that to build kit. Let's put BK to save my typing, right? And then, and then build kit has these various backends. Um, and they also take IR. So the, the IR, which in this case is LLB, sort of like this protocol that that these that they speak right and in bilkit's case it, it actually is a protocol so llb is defined in terms of proto protocol buffers and um, the way this communication happens is a grpc request it's actually a network call using grpc so what we're going to do now is try to build our own front end we're going to skip the docker file we're just going to start sending in llb to build kit to build our own image. Um, so you could do this in any language um, that has support for protocol buffers, I guess. I guess if they didn't have built in support, maybe, I don't know, you could build it. But yeah, 
Um, so I put together an example, which I called write LLB. So here's my example. Um, I'm using Go. The reason I'm using Go is because uh, build gets written in Go. And so there's a nice client library for LLB and it has documentation and, and it explains everything. Um, yeah, so we should be able to run that. If we do go run, write LLB, write LLB. So then we get this beautiful result, right? So, so protocol buffers are actually a binary format. So a little bit uh, challenge to read. Let's close this. Uh, but there it is. And you can see some things in there that make sense, like our local contacts and our Alpine latest. But but let's pretty this up. So we could do the same thing. Um, but BuildKit has some supporting functions we can do. Uh, we got to spell it right first. BuildCL, BuildCTL has a command called uh, dump LLB, which will write it out in a nice way in JSON. And then we'll pump it to JQ, which will just Printed out nice. Uh, broken pipe. This is not what I expected. Oh, let's try to add in debug. All right, there we go. So now we're getting maybe an easier to read LLB, and we can see what this LLB actually looks like in, in sort of its raw, uh, at least JSON formatted format. And it's not that complex, really. Like, here's our local context. That we're passing in. Um, here's our Alpine latest source. Uh, here's the architecture, machine architecture, OS. Uh, what else do we have in here? Here's our README. As you can see, there is a file op, and the action it's taking is copying from our source to our destination. Yeah, so that is the LLB. Now let's try to actually build this image. Right, so we can do the same thing, kind of utilizing uh, build CTL to help us out. So if we go back and delete all this, so we're gonna take our, we're gonna take this LLB, we're still gonna send it to build CTL, but we're gonna issue the build command. Um, this should be familiar from before, we pass it our local context. And we'll say output an image, call it demo three. So now, right, we are building something without a Docker file. We're just manually sending out the LLB. Right, so we can try to run that same way as always. So Docker run IT. And then we need to pull it. Uh, we'll call it or it was called demo three. And then we start a shell. And then it's pulling it down. Um, so the readme still there. And then our file was called built. Hopefully you can see this line. My head's not in the way. Um, so our file was called built and we echo programmatically built. So there we go. It worked. So I think this is actually pretty cool because now I can move beyond a Docker file if I want to, right? Um, you Programming languages offer abstraction. Um, they offer control flow. They offer libraries. There's, there's tooling. Um, so if you need to do something really complex where maybe you did need to have control flow, th this is just a great way to do it. You get all the tools that programming languages offer um, and you're still just building a, a standard Docker file. I think that's pretty neat. But let's go further, okay? Um, so like a true front end isn't just directly issuing hard-coded LLB statements. And we we wouldn't need to hard-code it, right? Like our Go program could take in arguments um, and use them to, you know, conditionally do things. But like when we think of a, of a real... Uh, front end, like it, it usually is more like this, where you're getting in text, like your source code. Um, and then, you know, you turn that into tokens, you tokenize it and like you parse it. 
And then, you know, you probably produce some sort of AST, some abstract syntax tree of the, the IR, which in this case is LLB. Uh, right. And then, and then that's what gets sent on. So, so we kind of just jumped in at this statement. So let's, let's do something more than that. Yeah. So I built this front end uh, for Docker files that I'm calling an ick file. So it's an alternative to Docker files. Um, and it's, it supports uh, intercal, which is a kind of a joke programming languages from the 1970s. Um, so I wouldn't use it for anything real. <laughs> it, it's more just something fun that I that I got to build while prepping for this demo. But I think it shows that you can go a long ways building your own front end on Docker. So, uh, you know, it has a parser, it, it has a Docker file to LLB converter. But the, the main thing that differs from your standard Docker front end is it has a uh, different terminology. So instead of saying copy, you say stash. Um, a lot of the terminology for Docker, now you have to put a please on the front. So that's an idea that came from Intercal where uh, you had to say please before you did everything, which uh, you know is more polite than run, uh, which is very commanding. Um, and in Intercal, there was actually a compiler error that said like, hey, you're not being polite enough. We're not going to compile this. Um, instead of from, you have come from. Instead of health check, you have, are you OK? Uh, et cetera. So to use this as uh, something that we can build Docker images with, we, we have to build it itself, right? So the way I'm going to do that is um, like this. So I'm going to build a Docker file. Actually, let's open that. Um, yeah, so I'm going to build this Docker file. So it's going to use the Golang Alpine image. It's going to copy in our files and just build them into a executable called ICFile frontend. And I'm just going to set that as an entry point. So um, Docker build, pass it the file. And so this is our fourth demo, I think. So we'll call this demo four. Like that, we can build it. And then something that's very cool is that Docker files support this syntax where you can actually specify a front end. So if you specify um, on your top line syntax equals and then the name of a Docker container. So here we're using the Docker container that we just pushed, agbell.demo4, then it's going to use that as the front end. So we don't need to call buildkit directly ourselves anymore. We can just use the normal Docker build command. Um, when it sees the syntax front end, it's going to find this image. And instead of using the normal Docker syntax, it's going to use what I define inside this, which is, is pretty cool, right? I don't even have to ask anybody to install my weird project. Um, and I can have them using come froms uh, and stashes and pleases instead of run. I mean, I, I don't recommend it, but but you can, right? This, this exists. You can use it right now. Um, yeah, I guess because I pushed demo four, anybody can use it uh, because it's on my Docker Hub account. So let's use this. Um, actually, let's let's push it just to be sure. So we push this ag bell. So now we're we've created an image um, that we're going to now use to to build images. So now. Um, we can just say standard Docker build. We're going to tell it to use our ick file format. Uh, I gave it a different name. Oh, it's called ick because uh, Intercal compiler was called ick because they were like, we made this language to be intentionally gross. Uh, so this is my ick file. And I'm going to call it demo5. I guess I should call it, uh, got to be consistent here, pgbell.demo5. Right, and without this front end, you know, this should never work. This is not valid syntax. But now we've created our, our own syntax for Docker files, and it seems like it worked. Um, or at least let's test it out. So now if I do Docker run, uh, ag bell demo five, and I'll start my shell again. Then the moment of truth is what shows up here. Bam, so it worked. We built 
our own uh, Docker file using a custom syntax that we built with our own custom front end um, using a container we, we built just a moment before that. So I think this is pretty neat that we can make our own front ends and back ends, and they can be much more complex than this light syntax change that I did or, or this five line Go program. These examples are just proof of concept, but the things you can do with this uh, can be real. Let me give you some examples. So something you could do with this is build your own AWS Lambda clone using the programmatic functionality we showed earlier. You could easily build like a service that takes a JavaScript function via a post request and then you know programmatically builds a container and ships it off to Kubernetes. That wouldn't be that hard, right? Like a proof of concept of that might be a couple hundred lines of code. You could also just build a specific image format for your org. This is called a mocker file. Uh, the creator noted that Docker files in his organization are mainly just a list of a whole bunch of packages that you need to call apt get on. So you could do them like line by line, right? But it, the problem is that creates a layer for each line. So then you end up putting them all in one line and then that's hard to read. So this is what he came up with. It's a front end that specifically lets you list them in a list format in YAML, and then it generates the LLB to just create them all at once. So it nicely constrains the solution space down to something um, that fits what he needed to do. But my big message about all this is we don't know what we can build with BuildKit until we try. When LLVM was created, Rust didn't exist, Swift didn't exist, Pixel Shader backends or WebAssembly didn't exist. It's once we had that tool that those things started to be created. And we now have this tool for creating cloud native workflows. So, so what should we do with it? Um, I work on this project called Earthly. We're using BuildKit features to make build pipelines that, that are pretty cool. But I want to see more projects building on these foundations. Like on a historical scale, I think that we're super early in computing and cloud computing. So we kind of get to decide what the future looks like. So, you know, your name here, your project here, what, what can we build? Uh, I'll leave that up to you. But if you do build something cool, let me know. And that's the talk. Um, I'm Adam Gordon-Bell. You can find me using that name anywhere on Twitter, on LinkedIn, in your podcast player, if you want to check out my podcast. Um, I'll share the links to the source. And if you build something cool with BuildKit, uh, let me know. And if you're looking for inspiration for something built using BuildKit that's a little bit different, take a look at Earthly. I think it's pretty neat. Thank you very much.